What's up guys, Steve here for Ask Steve number 13. If you're wondering what this is, you're new to the channel, you ask me questions in the comments of this video and in the next video, I just answer them. It's uh, you know, it's it's not very serious. We're just relaxing, talking with each other. You ask a simple question, whatever you wanna ask and I'll answer it. Anything you think I might know or if you just want someone to talk to. I've been buying and selling online for almost a decade. I'm pretty okay at it and a few other things, Pokemon, just kind of like life in general. I'm getting through myself. And if you need help with anything, you want to answer, ask a question, you want me to answer it on a video where I can kind of break it down, or maybe I'll use my whiteboard and it doesn't matter how long or short the, the question is, I'll answer it to the best of my ability. This is a completely free service. Anyone can ask as many questions as they want. I'm here to help. I'm dedicating all the spare time I can to these kind of videos. So please use me while it's still a thing that I can do. So we'll start this off with kicks and cards. I would love to see more videos about your single store because I feel like singles are much more accessible for a seller to begin with compared to graded cards and it would be a great resource for us sellers to learn from. Definitely, I have a few videos coming up for the single store. One that I'm recording either this weekend or next week and it will be pretty much my setup. Everything I use, everything I, my shelves, how I, you know, stack my packaging, how I keep my cards in the boxes, how I sort my inventory, and I'll like kind of break down how I prepare cards to list maybe in that video, maybe that'd be another video. If you have any things you need help with, if you're sitting there, you know, doing your own stuff, collecting, buying, selling, whatever you want to do, and you're like, damn, I wish I knew this a little bit better, just message me on Instagram and say, hey, Steve, you got any ideas, any tips? And if I have anything that's a little bit more in depth than like a one sentence, two sentence reply, I'll just make a video for you, man. I don't care how many videos I make on this channel. I don't care how many views, how many, anything, anything gets. It's not really like, my my goal is to help as many people as possible. So if you if you need help, use me. I'm here for as long as I'm doing this YouTube thing. Please use me. I mean, I don't know how many other people are out there that are willing to do that, but I'm here. And don't feel scared. Don't feel like you're wasting my time. Don't feel anything. I feel bad that you need some help and I'm not there to help you. So yeah, plenty more single stuff to come. Let's turn this uh, aircon on because it is hot in here. So yeah. But, you know, there's a few videos to come, but definitely I will be focusing more on singles as we get into next year. And as the, you know, graded cards stop coming back from PSA as much, I will be making more content on the singles cards. D. Woody, I'd love to see a video on your mindset and thinking how to handle cards based on condition. I recently picked up a $1,500 card, but I wouldn't say the condition is amazing. Maybe a PSA 6 at best. What would you do with a card like that? Okay, so that's one question. There's another question. I'll answer this question first. What would I do with a card that's $1,500? If you paid $1,500 for the card and you say it's a PSA 6 at best, sometimes it's really helpful if you tell me what the card is and maybe I can give better advice if I know all the information. But most $1,500 cards, if they're raw, non-graded, I would say, you know, if your intention is to sell it and you think a 6 is, if you know that the 6 sells for more than $1,500, I would say grade it. You know, just choose like the value tier of PSA, maybe $45, $40 a card, whatever it is right now. I'm not, I'm not 100%, but I would do that. Most expensive cards are way easier to sell when they're already graded. Apart from a few where like, this is going to sound pretty bad, but like if you have a near mint card and you think it's a seven, but like it might look like an eight and someone wants to buy it to gamble on an eight, you think it might, like they might think it might get an eight. You might think it might get a seven. And there's like, they think they might be able to make a little bit more money. And you think, okay, now nah, there's no way it's a seven. You can probably sell that raw. But if you bought it, you knew it's a six, I would just grade it. It's so much easier to sell those like more expensive cards when they're graded. Also, how to deal with damaged cards and not get bad reviews. I'm very hesitant to sell and list anything less than near mint. Am I missing a large portion of the market by avoiding damage slash played cards and backlogging them? Yeah, I mean, yes, you are. I'm going to answer that question completely truthfully, you are missing probably 70% to 80% of the non-graded market that isn't a brand new modern card. So if it's not like three or four years old, majority of those cards, they all sell light played, damaged, moderately played in mass amounts. I have sold thousands, at least this year with like my new single store. But back in the day when I used to only sell singles, it was so good to sell moderately played and played cards. You feel a little bit less like you feel it's it's completely different. Like you are scared to sell a played card to get a bad review where I'm scared to sell cards that I think are near mint because I'm worried that people will disagree with what I think is near mint. So it's funny how we think differently. But um, also eBay has their new 
eBay condition guidelines. If you just stick to those, if people leave you bad reviews, you can just get reviews. Like you just get them all removed because as long as you offer a return to the buyer, because sometimes people don't agree. I sell an e mint card, someone else buys it. They go, hey, this is not an e mint. It doesn't matter what I think and it doesn't matter what they think, but they have to send the card back and I have to accept it back. And that's completely fine. As long as I do that and they do that, they'll get their money back. I'll get my card back. The review will be removed. Yeah, it sucks a little bit. You lose a little bit of money in postage. I think the single card store, I'm not too sure, probably sold around like 5,000 singles in the past 12 months, give or take, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more, 3,000, four. I'm not 100% sure. We've had two cards where people have said, hey, this is not near mint. Can I get a return exchange? And some people ask for partial refunds. I don't really do that unless it's like someone that's bought regularly, unless it's like a $5 card and they just wanted a partial refund and it would cost them $4 to ship it back and you got to pay for that. Sometimes it's good just to like give them the refund or give them the partial refund. But if they leave your reviews and you offer them return, you do all the right things under the eBay guidelines and they, they do leave the negative feedback, you can just go to the eBay review page and go, hey, this, this is against the condition guidelines. This is against eBay policy. Please remove. And nine times out of 10, they will remove it. If they don't, then you got to go to live chat or like online support or phone support and they probably usually will remove it in my case they removed it every single time that i've got any sort of bad reviews when i did the right thing offered a return everything like that so don't be scared to sell play damage cards i've sold tens of thousands of play and damage cards they're my most favorite thing to sell because usually the buyer knows the buyer knows this card's played or damaged and i'm selling it i know it's played or damaged there's no like hoping that it's better both parties are agreeing that it's played or damaged and they feel really, really freeing to sell in my opinion. So, and also if you have like a car that's like light played and you say it's played, you sell it. Usually buyers are going to be happy because they're like, Hey, this is not play. This is more like light play near mint. If you have a card that's like played and you just put it as damaged, people go, Hey, this is not damaged. This is like, you know, played or like morally played. This is great. I got, I got more like value or they feel better because you said it was worse but it was actually better so they feel like they got a good deal and then those situations also don't come up i hope that helps you out camel bulk camel bulk do you do anything specific during holiday buying season i know you mentioned you bought a lot of one to two dollar cards to stock singles for lgs do you adjust prices or mass load inventory on your ebay store during these three months so oh this is like a three-part question do you do anything specific during buying holiday buying season? So that's people buying off me holiday, like me as the seller. No, not really online. There's nothing I really do. I've only really sold single cards or graded cards over the past five, six years. This will be the first year I sell like merch or like ready retail products. Uh, you know, like sealed booster boxes. This will be the one, like the first time I sell this kind of stuff. I'm giving it a try. I have some spare time. I'm trying to branch out a little bit, you know, this stuff. It doesn't really make anything or anywhere near as much, I guess, profit per like time put in as single cards or graded cards. But the plush, I just really love. Like I love these plush, like these pokey fits at the back. It's like $2 profit a lot of the time. Um, some of them can be like three or five depending. And maybe if I buy some like big pokey fit plush lots from someone that bought them off from Pokemon Center, it can be a little bit cheaper. But most of the time, this is like labor of love. So we'll see this Christmas to see if that's a difference. Me selling that if the like sales go up closer to Christmas, it might, it might, I'm not sure, but it, maybe I can answer this question in January, February. You can ask, did I notice anything different? Cause in the past, you know, until about COVID, I think COVID Christmas season didn't really count 2021 or 2020 and 2021. Cause everything was just crazy regardless. And in 2019, I wasn't that big of a seller. I might've sold 120,000 in that year. And you know, that's only 10 grand a month and it's, it's not as much as like now where it's like, you know, several hundred thousands in some months, sometimes. So you can notice a big trend sometimes. So, um, and then you mentioned the LGS. So yeah, I have a, you know, a deal with my local game store. I've been going there since I was 15 years old and that was about 15 years ago. And I've known the owner for a very long time. Five years ago, I approached him. I said, Hey, can I stock some cards in here? You can take a cut and I'll just keep putting more stuff in here. And it's worked out great for both of us. I'm super happy. Most of the stuff I put in there usually just breaks even or makes very, very little, but you know, it supports the store. He gets some money and it makes people happy going in there. But yeah, I, I usually buy like 5,000 to 20,000 $1 cards to put in kind of like over Christmas, just so people, 
they just have something to buy. I mean, it's just it makes me happy to know that people can get a good deal and get it in person. And maybe I make a little bit of money, but it's not really about like making huge profits during Christmas for me. Sometimes it's just about like, you know, getting stuff out there. Yeah, it's it's not like I'm trying to be a good Samaritan and trying to like give everyone give give everyone like a great deal and not make any money. But it's more about just pushing volume, breaking even, meeting new people, getting my name out there, making more sales rather than like turning on pure profit. Now, do I adjust prices or mass load inventory? I don't do anything different that I would normally do, but it is Christmas, so it might be good, you know, run a sale if you have a store, reduce some prices on stuff that's been sitting for a long time, it might get picked up. Other than that, just keep listing, keep going on, keep moving forward. That's the name of the game. Remember, the moment 25th of December is gone, it's 26th, it's 27th, you're in January, it's back to normal, it's everything like I don't change too much or switch up too much or get used to anything. Just keep focusing on the future. Buy and then sell. Buy and then sell. Or just collect or do whatever you can. Try and find some great deals. It's uh, not nothing too crazy. Christmas will be over and you'll be in next year before you know it. So, and next question is from no name at all. No, not at all name 20. That's a crazy username. Uh, oh, that's a big one. That's a That's a big question. I recently PSA graded a 2001 Koro Koro Shining Mew from my personal collection. I thought it would get a 10, thereby paying $300 grading fee based on the final graded tens, final value of graded 10s on eBay, and then it came back a 9. And if I sell it at a PSA 9 price, my margin is quite low. When I coupled it with the price, I originally acquired the raw card. So there is a lot more to this question, but I'm just going to address this first part. So... You use the $300 grading fee, and I think of Koro Koro Mew PSA 10 is around $2,200 to $2,500. Correct me if I'm wrong. And the rule of thumb is you should never really try to pay more than 10% for like the card grading, because that's usually how PSA does their pricing tiers. It's all based on like 10% of the card's value. That's what they want to get out of it. So with a card like the Shining Mew, the most I would ever submit it at, even if it was a pure 10 candidate, would be like 45, the value plus, the one above from bulk. The insurance is a little bit less, but I wouldn't really ever want to put anything more in it because, you know, if it gets a nine or good, even God for a second, an eight, you're in for a world of hurt. Now, you do mention I graded it from my personal collection, and this is just, that's a little bit, you know, you're worrying about value so much, but it is in your own collection. And if I, it was me and I graded something out of my collection, I would always want the cheapest grading possible just because I don't care how fast it comes back and anything like that. It is sad that this did happen for you and you sounds like you pretty much just bought a PSA 9 instead of buying a raw card and grading a PSA 9. So maybe you haven't lost anything, which is great also. And then we'll we'll read the rest of this. Yeah, so yeah, just to readdress it, it's just, you know, most cards, unless they're like $10,000 plus, I would never submit anything above like 150. Me personally, like, you know, that recent submission, I got Gold Star Charizard, Mysterious Mountains Charizard, Crystal Charizard, whatever else you know, Mewtwo Battle Festers, that was all sent in bulk because I'm not willing to just send them at 45, 150, 300 because, you know, get a bad grade. It just, you know, it takes up a lot of the money. And, you know, these fees, they do add up. You know, they don't feel like they're adding up because you get so excited about the grade, but you just grade that at that high price and then you put it in the shelf and then it just sits there and then you just have dead money. You want to get this grading price the cheapest possible. So it does come with a little bit of risk because if PSA damages it, They'll pay you out a lower amount. And PSA has damaged a few of my cards this year. So it is a very high chance, but that's all about, that's all a part of the game <laughs> is what it is. All right. This next question from you, it's a long one. So, yeah. okay. I should have paid for cheaper grading service tier based on PSA 9 final value. Has this ever happened to you where you overpaid for the grading because the card came back at a lower grade? And what do you do about it? Do you try and regrade and risk losing all potential for profit? So that is something, you know, if you really do truly think it is a PSA 10 and it's like a 9 slash 10, it's like a strong 9 week 10, there is a world where, I'm not telling you to, but there is a world where you could crack it out and regrade it in bulk one more time. You know, you already paid 300, so 315 isn't that much of a problem. If it does get a 10, they'll probably charge you 300 again, or maybe 150, depending on how they feel. But I will say, if you get a 9, they'll probably charge you like $99, because that's usually what they charge for those kind of cards. So either 75 or 99, depending on how they feel. And they might charge you 99, 
and then you paid $400 just to get another nine. Those are the risks, okay? And then we're at, from your experience, how true is it that PSA will hand out grades based on what service you pay for? Well, that sounds like a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I hear rumors that if you pay for a higher service for a more expensive card, they will be inclined to give you the higher grade and vice versa. If you pay down for what should be an expensive PSA 10 card, they will give you a nine instead. What has your experience if PSA comes back and later upcharges you on a card they deem to fall into a higher service tier? Should we purchase lower tier service for grading just in case and let them reach out if we need to pay the difference when the card turns out to be a higher grade? Whoa, that's a lot to swallow. So, you know, it's, it's, it's it just goes both ways. Like, you know, you send at the higher tier, they'll mark down your grade. If you send at the lower tier, they charge you more. It's a little bit of a conspiracy theory, to be honest. And, um... I don't think it holds that much merit because I've graded many cards at higher tiers and, you know, I've got many tens on cards that are 20, 30, $40,000. So I, you know, I don't know why they would do that. I think PSA is a little bit too busy to be worrying about those things. And now I'm not going to say you have a cheap card, but a Koro Koro Shining Mew, it's only $2,200. I mean, that's, um, it sounds bad when I say that, but like PSA is grading cards that are $2,200, probably one every minute maybe even five every minute. I can't imagine, you know, I don't know. I don't work there, but like that isn't something that they're focusing on and trying to like make sure they control the population or screw over their customer. Why would they want to screw over their customer? You know, your conspiracy, the, 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 well, not yours, but the theory itself is like they would downgrade you if you pay more. Well, wouldn't they give you a better grade if you're paying more because you're paying more and then you send it in bulk and then they want to upcharge you so they can give you the higher grade but also get more money. It's just kind of like a, you know, I have had many cards that if they got a 10, PSA would be able to charge me $300 instead of 15. But instead, I get a 9, and they don't charge me $300. So it could have happened to some people and not happen to others. It's just a whole bunch of... Maybe we'll do a PSA conspiracy theory video, because uh, that is a, you know... Mm. Who knows? But yeah, what happened with your card in particular, the PSA 9 that you graded? You can probably chalk it up to an expensive learning experience and just knowing that you should only try to spend the least amount of possible on the grading and just wait, use the time. You say it's from your collection. So whenever I grade collection cards, I usually throw them in bulk because if I'm keeping it, I don't want to keep an expensive grading fee in my shelves, in my boxes, in my vault for the longest time. So I hope that helps you out. For Yero Rocher, from a perspective of pure profit, let's go. To fund collecting, of course. Oh, you <laughs> you twisted the words there. You went from a perspective of pure profit to fund collecting, of course. It doesn't matter if you're trying to get more money to buy more cards. It doesn't matter if you're doing it for collecting or if you're doing it as a store. I, I am a, I'm a businessman. I'm a scumbag. I'm buying stuff and I'm selling it with the intention to make profit every single day. I probably sold something while I've been recording this video. I mean, I don't know where my phone is. And I can't find it anywhere, but it's usually around it somewhere. And I probably would check it right now. And there would be a sale there on something that I made profit on. But the difference is, my main goal is to buy as many cards as possible. So, you know, some people have a, like, they just want a profit. Maybe they want to buy out a whole bunch of things or a brand new release or do something like that. That's not really like what I'm into, but I just want to buy stuff. Anything I can find, you know, even this stuff here, this, uh, Shiny Mega Rayquaza. I sold another. I sold one of these last week, actually. And then I went out, I looked online to see what I could find, and I bought another one. I sold the other one for about $100 less. No, no, sorry. $100 more than I bought the next one for. And does that make me a bad person? I still now have two Shiny Rayquazas, P plush Pikachu. The other one's on the way. But now I have $100 more. So it's kind of like a... It's fine to sell things with the perspective of pure profit. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? Every business in the world that is successful does it. That's how businesses work, and that's how you get more value. Next, do you think it's better to buy and sell numerous low-value items, not necessarily low margin, just items that yield maybe three to five USD profit, and aim for a few or aim for a few higher-end items like PSA 10 alternate arts? Items that are repeatable sales but offer 100 USD profit per unit with a larger cost per unit. For context, my eBay store has 200 feedback at 100% positive, and I've sold a half a dozen 200 USD items in the past without a hitch. But that's a pretty good question. Perspective of pure profit. 
I think this is a should be from the perspective of where you're at in life. You know, if you have like fifty thousand dollars, well, if you have fifty thousand dollars to start off with, and you're working like you know nine to ten hours a day, I wouldn't recommend you come home and try to flip as many singles as possible. As is my lighting going, it's not that great, but oh well. How good does this plushy wall look, by the way? I worked really hard on that. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you already have a decent amount of money, I wouldn't suggest trying to flip one to five to ten dollar singles constantly like crazy. I mean, if you love that, if you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. But you could probably move in to just, you know, selling a few higher end items, maybe grading some cards that are modern but expensive and getting some PSA 10s. And people aren't paying you like a value increase. They're just paying you for the service of getting the card in a 10. That, that's pretty much like what you're offering. You know, like, you know, I can't really, uh, what's the card? Like Charizard EX SAR from 151. That's a great card. It sells for around $70 more in PSA 10 than it does if you bought the card raw. At least last time I checked, like last week. And you're pretty much getting paid that $70 difference just to get the cards in, package them up, ship it to PSA. They come back and you sell them. That I wouldn't really say there's a huge value difference in between the Raw and the PSA 10. It's just like the time difference, the effort difference, all those other things. So if you have more money focusing on stuff like that, it probably is a better idea. That's currently what I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of stuff like that. I also do the Raw cards because, you know, my girlfriend helps me and we don't have normal jobs. So we're just doing this all day and we have time for all of it. But if you're a brand new seller and you're like, you know, a more of a younger person, maybe like I was in... Oh, like it's eight years ago and I was selling Wizards of the Coast Commons on eBay and I had thousands of them, but I was buying them for like five cents each in bulk. I was trying to buy a thousand at a time, driving to people's houses, driving two hours out of the city to try and buy these collections for like a hundred dollars, fifty dollars, where I'd get like a thousand or two thousand cards and I'd split them up and I'd sell them for like two, three, five dollars each, sell the rares for a bit more, make some like complete sets here and there, put them together. I would post on Facebook, people like send me lists and I'll go through them for you because I was only working like 20 to 30 hours a week at my supermarket job. I had more time to be able to offer that sort of like mass single selling service. I don't think from the perspective of pure profit, obviously doing the thing that gives you the best value for money is, is going to be worth it. Like for me, what did I sell today? Where's my phone? I don't know where it is. Um, oh. I can't remember. I think I sold today. Like, uh, I haven't put the video up on YouTube yet. It's probably going to be up before this video goes up, but, or it might not be, but I sold a Cubone from Clash of the Summit, a reverse foil. I sold that for $300 on eBay and I paid roughly, you know, $25 for that card, $30 for the grading. This is AUD, of course. So after fees on eBay, I'm at around like $250 and I paid like $55. I made $200 with that card. There is not that much effort in me getting the card from the collection, card savering it, submitting to PSA, and then listing it. There's probably like three to four minutes of overall work in that card because I put, a few, put it in a few videos and all this other stuff. Probably even less. Maybe like two minutes that I have into that card. Is that $200 for those two minutes time that I got paid? Most likely not because it's a part of other things. But that was an extremely high amount of money for the amount of time I put in. Finding that card, taking the risk is a very high amount of risk. Like buying that card, if I get a nine, it's all over. I usually just, I wouldn't break even. But in comparison to this, all these plushies where I make like, you know, $3 to $5, probably even less. I think it depends on where people live and the postage costs and everything. It's, it can get pretty, some of them are break even or maybe even lose a dollar. So it's, uh, and that takes the same amount of time to like put them in the inventory package and ship it it takes a little bit more time because i gotta like make sure i card save with the tag make sure it's all nice in the box and presented well and like it's i have to put them in a curio bag and everything similar amounts of effort of selling that psa card versus selling something i make like two dollars I'd, I'd probably have to sell like 70 of these plush to make the same amount that i made on one card grading psa just a random reverse hollow cubone it's uh it just really depends it, it's it's one of those things where Everyone wants to do the 100, 150, 200 USD things, but they don't sell as often. They're not as easy. They don't come around as easy. And usually when they do happen, there's a very short time frame where it's profitable to do so. So I, it, I think it's a great thing just to have a mix of both. You don't have to go all in on singles. You don't have to go all in on spending your time selling things for $50, $100 profit, $200 profit, because those things are harder to do and they usually take more risk. Like my Charizard 151 reference, 
if you get a PSA 9, well, you probably lose like $50 and that's pretty bad. You don't want to lose money, right? But that's the risk. You can lose it. Whether you are selling like a $3 to $5 single, well, there's no real risk. The only risk is you put your time into listing it and no one ever buys it. But with something that's hot and in demand, like a PSA 10 151 Charizard, there's less risk because you know it's if as long as you put it as the lowest price on eBay, it's probably going to sell by the time you wake up the next morning. So I hope that big spiel helped you a lot with like everything that you asked. If you want a little bit more uh, in depth, just feel free to ask more questions on that and I'll do my best. Um, I feel like that was one of my best answers I could ever give. Wow. Like, you know, this channel has gone for like around, around a year now. Seriously, at least. And I feel like I'm getting better. I feel like I'm getting better on the camera. I feel like I'm getting better talking. I feel like I'm getting better in general, being like a showman and everything. But I think that's in life. You just get better at things you get, uh, things you do more of. Just like a lot of these questions, I recognize the names. And you guys are getting a lot better at asking the questions. And you guys are getting better, like getting the information out of me. Way better than just asking like a broad general, like, what should I buy? You ask a few things about like that question right there. Should I focus on this or should I focus on that? We're all learning together and it's great to see. I mean, it's honestly, I can't wait to get like our Steve 40, our Steve 70. I'm probably sitting there in like a Game of Thrones chair and we're learning like, maybe I can fly you guys out. We can have an in-person thing. No, I'm kidding. But we'll get on to the next question. All right. Kicks and cards. Sometimes I buy singles that I think are undervalued and believe will go up in the future. Instead of just holding on to the cards for potentially years, what are your thoughts on... Sorry. What are your thoughts on just listing them right away at, but at double the price? Is that better than holding and hoping they go up in future? So I think this video went up like two weeks ago. So I had a whole bunch of videos that went up since then. And uh, this question is pretty good. And it's pretty um, on point with like my my Pokemon investing video that I did, as a, which I regret doing, honestly. But um. I did a video on Pokemon investing and I didn't really talk about investing in Pokemon at all, just like general life things and how to get better at, you know, buying and selling cards and just getting better at being a better collector and looking for value and etc. And I described that same situation. What's the point of buying something and, and investing in it if you don't even know there's demand or anything to start off with? So, you know, it's, you know, I'm probably going to shoot myself in the foot here, but I'm doing the same thing with these Poncho plushies. I, I like absolutely love these things. Like the, these are like... I've had this one. I've had these for like four or year, five years now. I've had these for a long time and I want more of them. But, you know, I, I am, I'm trying to be a responsible adult and I can't just buy 10, 20, $30,000 worth of these Poncho Pikachus and clear out the whole market and buy as many as I can because I want to see if they actually sell first. So, you know, I listed a whole bunch of mine. I picked up a few others online that I saw that were pretty cheap. But until then, I'm not going to pay like newer, higher prices until I see, okay, this plush, I listed it for this. It took six months to sell. So maybe if I see that up, I'm only going to buy two of them. I'm not going to keep buying them because that doesn't sell that fast. And I'm just trying to, I'm, it's like breaking into a new thing. Similar with what you're doing. And if I do say that, if you go out and buy Poncho plush, you, <laughs> I feel bad. Don't do it because cards sell so much faster. If you're looking to make money, don't do this. But because I've kind of like conquered the card thing. I'm happy to do the plush. Just letting you know. Feel free to buy these things and try and sell them for more because it's not going to work that fast for you and you're going to feel pretty sad. But that's what I'm trying to do because I just want to get more of these as a collector because I love these, but I can't justify it as a human, as a seller, as a store. So I need to like sell some to actually see if it's worth it. So what you're saying is you want to buy a few... Let's say you're buying a cards that you think are undervalued. You buy three of them. Just list one of them. Just see how it goes. List one of them for double the amount. Turn best offer on, see what people do. See if you get any offers. If you get an offer that's over what you sold it for, and maybe you can try and find another one. Maybe you know there's like a local store that has one for sale and you have a better offer on eBay or maybe some weird random sites all around the world in Europe, Japan, UK, anywhere. You don't know, anywhere. You can use that to, you can use that sort of like information to, to your benefit. So yeah, it's a great idea. I think, um, buying a single and then holding it and hoping it goes up in the future is probably the worst thing you can do it is the absolute worst thing you can do the hope that something will just go up because you might as well just put your money in a savings account you get paid like five percent interest at the moment that's guaranteed there's no hope it's guaranteed there's no hope 
it doesn't matter what you think or say or feel. It's no, there's no hope involved. It's guaranteed five percent. So the way you're doing it is way better than buying and hoping it goes up. Erratic wool gathering two eight four seven. Could you tell me roughly what percent of your sales come from your website versus eBay store? I have been selling on eBay exclusively for the last few years and have been wondering if it's worth it. Venture of creating my own website and trying to direct customers from eBay to there. Plus, I see pluses I see are email lists, discounted fees, minuses I see are increased hassle, work, risk, etc. Thanks as always, friends. So I think I've broken down this a few times, but uh. sorry. Um, I've done this a few times, but I love this question. So my why I I'll just explain why I made a website. Back in 2017, listing bulk cards, lots of singles under eBay was like pretty much impossible. We didn't have the eBay multi-listing tool like we do now. We had eBay Turbo List, whatever that was, it was garbage. And it was impossible to manage multiple thousands of items without using like these third-party programs. I host my website on Shopify and I noticed it was like way better. It was like a, a way better. And I was selling cheap singles and on eBay, you can only have cards up for 99 cents. But on your website, you can have them for 20, 30, 40. And I had, you know, 50, 50,000, 100,000. I didn't know how many singles I had. Probably 100,000 singles that I wanted to list. And a lot of them were very, very cheap. 20 cents, 30 cents, 50 cents. And I just wanted to sell them. So I put everything on a website. And the a few other benefits was like, we can go off eBay because I always got messages to go off eBay. This was before eBay brought in like these automatic taxes and everything. But, you know, people always want to go off eBay. They find you on Instagram. If you go, hey, link the website, here it is. So that's good. So even if you get the same amount of money for the sale, whether it's on eBay or the website, you still get the sale guaranteed because the person saves their fees and they save like the automatic sales tax and everything like that. There's a few minuses. Like my website, I pay a hundred US dollars a month. I'm on like a Shopify advanced plan. So you can get like a lower selling fee, 1%. And then I there's a few apps I use to help like manage the site and they are also like 100 USD per month all up. So the website cost me 200 USD a month. That's a lot of money. You know, even if you're a store that sells 10 grand a month, 200 USD a month, 2% flat from your bottom line is like uh, pretty crazy. But luckily for me, I sell a little bit more. So it's still worth it for me to hold a website. The increased work is, is, is quite frustrating. You're going to manage two platforms. Like this week, me and Kim are working on the website the whole week to make it look better. You know, feel free to jump on the website. It should be up now. Let me know what you think. We're trying to make it, I'm trying to make it look a little bit better, maybe a little bit more personal. And I'm trying to make it more like a normal website as I bring these like products onto the thing. My website was never designed to be like, you know, these other big websites that you go on and they're super fancy and they have all like the products there. It's pretty much a place so that I can have my items listed and people can get them off eBay for 10% cheaper or 15% sometimes. That's, that's the reason I made it. But now I'm trying to make it look better. Let me know what you think. And then emailing lists, I don't use those personally, but it is great. Discounted fees, we said that. And then, yeah, you can just go direct to the customer. They feel better just buying it off you. They get it cheaper. That's the best thing. There's a lot of added costs with eBay sometimes, especially if you're buying from like Europe or it's pretty much just Europe. I mean, US has the sales tax too, but European, so they, they get absolutely destroyed. It actually breaks my heart. So like people buy stuff like $20 on eBay and they end up paying like 70 because they pay like fees and then plus $27 or something. And it's, it's insane. So if I can offer that to people, I have a lot of Europeans that buy from my website. So that's a, that's a really big plus for them. And then roughly what percentage of my sales, it's like a 70, 30 split. There's still so many sales on eBay, even though I have my website and all my descriptions and you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. Like I put it around a few places. It's not that obvious to some people and people want to buy on eBay so they can feel protected and everything like that, which is perfectly fine. But most of the sales are still on eBay. So I hope that helps you out with that. I do think anyone that does maybe get to like five to $10,000 a month, maybe try a Shopify basic plan. There is a, there is an app called marketplace connect and that'll put all your items onto eBay really easy. So try that out, see how that goes for you. And then. If you need any help with any of the Shopify stuff, just message me. I'll help you out. Mm. Next question, Michael Duck. You had like a huge thing, but I, I put this just into the question, but I did read a funny comment that you said about how like my PSA grading things need to change because like I 
don't just take five minutes to show each grade and then scream at the top of my lungs. But yeah, that was pretty funny. I don't know. I don't mind doing the... I don't mind that like some people when they do their PSA returns, like the really big content creators, they make a big spectacle out of it. But for me, getting like 20 returns in one week sometime, I just want to show them off, get through them so I can list them and sell them. Listing and selling them is my main goal. The content creators aren't selling theirs. They're like keeping them for the collection. So they need like the views and the, the reach and they need like the engagement so they can like make money through our YouTube channels. It's completely different goals, but I like to just get through mine. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, wouldn't you mind, wouldn't mind if you showed off some of your more treasured collections. I understand why you wouldn't do this, but some of them, some of the truly more rare and valuable items that most of us wouldn't even be aware of would be cool to see. You could make this an educational style video on where, when, how, who, why of the card and also have you consider a vlog style day in the life video. This would be a bit tedious to edit and maybe crossing some personal barriers, but I think a lot would be interested in watching. So that's pretty good. So I actually am just like the video on the whole setup. I will be doing a day in the life of a full-time card seller video soon. I'm just writing this. This is something like it's a little bit bigger than like an RSD video or a grading return. Because I need to like plan it out, make a script, figure out how I want to do it. I'll be recording it using my phones and stuff like that. But like, it's a little bit more effort with editing. But as I get more time, as less returns come back, and I've cleared out a lot of work, and all I got to do is list singles most of the day. It's, um, I am doing something like that soon. But remember, I'm not like a crazy video creator. I'm still learning. I'm learning how to cut and edit and everything. I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm just a man that's trying his best doing the videos. So. I've, I've figured out how to have a setup and hit record, but most of the editing stuff I'll need to have people help me out, but I will be doing a day in the life video for sure. It might be in a month, might be in two months. Who knows? All right. Uh, um, I think a lot would be interested in watching that kind of video. And before you think this will be boring, most fit fitness channel thrive off this material. And most of it is literally their morning routine, drive to the gym, the workout and what they ate. Yeah, don't change anything about your filming style or presentation. Love what you do. Well, thanks a lot, Michael. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I will be doing something like that. It does take a little bit more effort when you're doing this stuff, but I, I never really considered this whole YouTube channel to be even what it is now. I find myself, personally, my YouTube channel to be an ex insane success for what my first goals reached. Like, I just wanted to get... When I first started on YouTube, I just wanted to get one video with a thousand views. That was my goal. I was like, okay, get a thousand views. I usually don't make goals based around like things you can't control, but I just wanted to know what it felt like. And now it's uh, crazy. I mean, if I, my YouTube personally, this might sound pretty stupid, but if my YouTube stays at the same size that it currently is forever, and I just make a video a day or maybe a video every two days, that puts me over the moon. If I stay exactly the same, how it is right now, how many views? 60,000 a month. I mean, that's nuts. This many people. Who I don't. If it goes down, who cares? If it goes up, who cares? I hope it doesn't, to be honest. To go up sounds bad, but like the, the increase, like stress and pressure, and there's a lot more. The, the wider I go, the wider I go in the audience, I get more and more like, I don't want to say stupid comments, but there is like a lot of like, just people just writing stuff that it doesn't bother me. Nothing really bothers me, but it's just like, you know, it's just, I don't want to deal with it. I just don't want to deal with it. I just, I just don't want to deal with it. I want to, I want to have fun with the YouTube channel. It's like a hobby. It's not really a part of the business, to be honest. So this isn't even anything focused or anything to do with my card selling stuff. This is like my hobby. I really enjoy this. I like exactly how it is now. And I would like it not to change. It, you know, I can't control that. I'm just going to keep making videos. But yeah, uh, I'll, I'll keep doing what I'm doing because it makes me happy and it's hard to make those good videos with lots of edits. So whenever you see those YouTube creators that have like voiceovers and cutting and editing and showing off all stuff like this guy is named OK J Love. His videos are crazy edits. I mean, he's, he puts a lot of effort in. So when you see those kind of things, always make sure you message or comment in their videos and go, hey, I really enjoyed the effort you put into editing this video because a lot of those people have jobs. They have things outside of YouTube and they put a lot of effort into those things to make, you know, content for stuff. People like us. So definitely. Link 2893 would like a video for Australians starting an actual card selling business on eBay, including an ABN and business accounts. Cheers, Steve. Well, that'll probably never come, Link. Um, you know, I'm not interested in giving a tax advice, accountant advice, anything that comes with like opening, getting an ABN and a business account. You know, that stuff's pretty straightforward once you get to that level. It's pretty easy. ABNs, you can just apply online. A business, a business bank account. 
you just apply to the bank and just give them your ABN. There's nothing really more to do by like, I have heaps of videos already on starting an eBay account, how to start it off. I have hundreds of, not really hundreds, but dozens of videos on sourcing cards for profit, even how I personally use like PSA grading to like to, to make money and a bunch of other things I have already up. All you got to do is kind of like watch them, learn from them, get a little bit of feel for yourself, maybe start selling some things. You don't really need to worry about any of this if you haven't even like sold anything before. So that this is like way down the line stuff because you know the, the advice for Australians and for anyone else in the world is pretty much the same. It just depends on how like, you know, their, their tax systems are set up and how the businesses are set up. But yeah, getting an ABN and starting a business bank account is extremely easy with like five minutes of Googling. It's not something that I'm comfortable just like putting it out there and giving the advice because it's, uh, eh, I can't explain it, but I don't want to be like liable if anything goes wrong. <laughs> so there you go. Okay. TJ Colts sold two cards on eBay. Immediate payment setting always on. Three days later, the card is out for delivery and the buyer deletes his account. And so eBay canceled the transaction and saved my payout will still go through. Everything I looked up to still seemed, every, everything I looked up, it seemed like eBay still pays out. But do I have to be on the lookout for them trying to scratch the money back in the coming weeks? Has this ever happened to you? I'm sure it has. Thanks, TV boy XOXO. So yeah, TJ, it's pretty normal. I don't know why it happens. I'm sorry. I don't know why it happens. A lot of the times people like, they don't have eBay accounts. They just check out with guest accounts and then they try to like delete the, the guest accounts afterwards because they're like, I don't want to have an eBay account. I don't know why it happens. I've never had the money taken away from me after like I've had the email where it's like the buyer to leave their account. You don't have to do anything. You're still going to get paid. But you know, if, if this happens in the future to anyone, always feel free. Reach, reach out to me on Instagram. That's like a, that's a question I can kind of like assure you and like kind of like you know, calm everything down and let you know that it's normal. Cause you know, if that takes two weeks for me to reply to this, I actually feel kind of bad TJ. Cause that seems, that's like a pretty dire thing and you'd feel pretty worried at, in the time. So always feel free to reach out on Instagram, but yeah, you don't really have to, I don't know why it happens. It just happens. And then another question from TJ, when do you, when do you get an assigned eBay rep? Like what's the threshold of sales per month you have to do? Getting through their system as a small seller to ask about the problem above was incredibly hard and just made me wonder at what point I would have access to an eBay rep. Um, I can't really, I don't really know to be honest, cause you know, in Australia and in the U S it's completely different. All I know is I have been the number one individual cards, like in the category CCG individual cards, I have been the number one sales volume sales amount for like three and a half years from when they started really tracking it on eBay, Australia. And then, you know, two years ago, it told me I had a rep that the person that is in charge of like the collectibles category, I can ask them any questions. It's not really anything. I don't like, I don't use it that often other than like they send me certain promotions that only I have like access to, or like really big sellers have access to and a few other things other than that. But, and they're not like fee discount promotions. It's kind of just like promotions like you know ebay will do a 10 percent sale discount or coupon and i have to give five percent and then ebay will cover five percent so the buyer gets 10 percent off but i only have to cover five percent of that coupon i usually just say accept all those things but yeah i'm not really sure what it's like just how to get an ebay rep usually they just reach out as far as i'm aware i've had friends in america who i know that sell a hundred thousand dollars a month and they asked ebay and they said there's nothing available so i really don't know to be honest um yeah i really feel like they should have a more like dedicated support even for like people that sell more than a thousand dollars a month because that's like one percent of sellers i can imagine and i really think they should have that but in my experience i've had a lot of success using the ebay help support line and the phone line so but i'm not sure what it's like in america so i feel like it should be the same but it will see well i'm not really too sure so this question here was pretty much asked by two different people so I'm just like combining their question into one. Uh, Materne Music and Just Jack 21. Japanese search terms. Since you're always sourcing cards, how do you deal with your translated search terms for buying Japanese cards on different websites? Do you save them in the notes on your phone? Any advice on how to get better results other than Googling Translate? My results are always over the place for Japanese Makari. Searching one specific card or Pokemon is easy. I just struggle to find what to search for collections. 
Okay, so like the advice I'm about to give is uh, not really Japanese focused, but in general, if you're searching on a website, it doesn't matter what language it's in, like uh, it depends where you're buying from, but you want to be searching in the native language of where the website is based. Like on my website, if you search in Japanese, you're not going to find anything because everything's in English. So when you're searching in Japan, obviously searching in J Japan language helps. When I'm searching in some European sites, I use whatever the Pokemon names are in whatever. And usually like Bulbapedia has a pretty good range of like translations. Google Translate's a little bit weird sometimes, but sometimes I just Google like, you know, Pikachu in German, Pikachu in this, because uh, I buy a lot of Japanese cards from all over the world and I have bought, bought them on really weird websites and people that are, they have them in the UK and they've had them in like Europe and stuff where people like they don't it's not English first language but Japanese search terms usually just like I just google a Pokemon I use the Bulbapedia thing I don't really like use the translate too much for exact words sometimes because they don't really translate to what people are putting up but I will say when you're trying to find like collections not just from Japan just anywhere in the whole world you have to be as like vague is that the right word vague as possible you can't just write like pokemon binder collection profit or something and put that in expect something to pop up most of the time it comes with like in my experience like stuff that i found if i'm looking for a certain set i have to search that exact set because some people just put the set in the title it doesn't matter whether it's on ebay or yahoo or makari or anything you're buying from around the world card market or any of these other like weird random websites it's sometimes it's like you have to really really be vague or you have to be so precise that maybe they put that i bought some collections that people just put trading cards trading cards as the title so maybe if you put pokemon collection you'd never find that so i search everything i search trading cards i search pokemon card collection i search pokemon i search cards i search pikachu card i search charizard i once found a card a long time ago a Shadowless Charizard. This is a funny story. I bought a Shadowless Charizard from the UK. And the, I just typed in Char, Charizard. I accidentally wrote Charizard. So instead of Charizard with like Z-A-R-D, I put Chari Z-A-D into eBay. And not only did the person have it in like wrong name, they also had it in the wrong, like in the wrong category. So there would never be a chance that anyone would ever find that. It was like a Shadowless Charizard. It was like $35. It was actually so funny. I bought it. And they shipped it to me in a PWE overseas. So like $2 in stamps, overseas mail, PWE, Shadowless Charizard, unsleeved. And it came perfectly fine and it actually graded PSAA. That was funny. What was that? Like 2018, 2019 or something like that? That's funny times. That's fun times back then. <laughs> but <laughs> just remember, you have to be as vague as possible and just use like the price range thing maybe to find things. Or you have to be so honed in. Or maybe luckily find stuff. Just remember finding like big collections, stuff like that. It usually doesn't come with like any sort of like you search for them and you just find them. It's more of like a first come, first serve, first person to see this thing. In like the first like five to ten minutes, there are so many people like looking for cards to buy and sell for profit. Anything like majorly profitable sells within the first like 20, 30 minutes. Everything's gone. It's so yeah, you have to be first. You have to search a lot. I highly suggest not using your phone to like search for things overseas you know, use your computer and then save with like bookmarks in certain search things. So you don't always have to find the search names and keep searching them up. Just like I have one tab on my computer that has over like a bookmark that has over a hundred tabs. I click the bookmark and every single thing that I want to search for comes up. And I probably do that around like 40 to 50 times per day. I'll do it, you know, when I get up. I'll eat some breakfast. I'll do it again. I'll go through every single tab, check any new listed item on all different websites that I'm searching on. I do it again. And 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 some days I find nothing. And I've searched maybe, you know, for like seven to 10 hours in the day. I'm looking for stuff to buy. And I find nothing, but some days I find great stuff. It's a long game. And, you know, it's kind of like a lottery. <laughs> kind of like a slot machine where you like pull the slot, but it doesn't cost any money to play. But you just have to keep pulling. And then when you find something good, you have, then you pay money. It's, uh, it doesn't really make sense, but I uh, hope that helps. <laughs> I, hope, or I hope all my rambling helps anyone. Um, I don't know what this name is. A uh, Chow Poison Cube Head 1489. Isn't the value from the population and how it's so low? I was looking at the Japanese Neo Lugia, like the one you got out of 10. Congrats, by the way. 
The English one is ten in ten is thirty thousand, but there's only forty of them. Doesn't that drive the value? I'm not sure how pop affects value. I assume it does though. Oh, my throat is actually so dead. I need so much water. Oh. So that's a good question because, you know, population and how many there are and how many there are for sale. There's so many different things. <clears throat> so in my experience, I'm going to use your card as a reference. The PSA 10 Lugia Neo Genesis, it's extremely hard to grade. And, you know, it's rarer than a Neo Genesis Japanese Lugia. Because in a Neo Genesis English booster box, 36 packs and only 12 packs have hollows. And there is, what is there, 19? Is there 19? There's 18 or 19 hollows in that set. So in every box of Neo Genesis English, you probably only have like a 70% chance to get a Lugia. But in, in, in Japanese Neo Genesis, they are... Not only are they printed in a far better quality, so they're easier to get in a 10 on average, because Neo Genesis English has so many print lines, it's like destroyed. So Japanese Neo Genesis, not only is it in better condition, but the box comes with 60 packs. And in every pack, there's a hollow, 99% sure. And there probably is the same amount of hollows, like 18 or 19. So usually you would get like two to three Lugias in one box, pack fresh. But English, you would get like maybe one. So... And then up until like 2019, Japanese Neo Genesis boxes were way cheaper in comparative, in comparison. Oh my God, these hiccups. I can't do these hiccups. <laughs> I hope the hiccups don't make the video bad. Kim always tells me you should edit out your hiccups and it's a lot of work to be honest. I hope they don't really piss people off because I will start editing them out if they do annoy you guys. Um, There is, in the, like the back in the day, the Japanese box was actually such a big value difference compared to the English because there were so many Japanese cards. Now it's a bit closer. I think Neo Genesis English is probably only like three times the price of a Japanese box. But back in the day, it was like 25 to 30 times the box. As far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, but it used to be a huge difference because Japanese packs, there were just so many of them and you get a guaranteed holo in every single one. So it was kind of crazy. But like sometimes population does affect price. But and when you compare the two cards, like English and like Japanese of the same Neo Holo Lugia, the English one is more expensive, 30,000, whatever amount. I, I honestly think like 30,000 for that card, in my opinion, is way too much. But I don't collect English cards. I don't sell English cards. I have nothing to do with English cards anymore. Previously, that I mean, I, cannot, I can see a world where that card's only $10,000 in a few years' time. And the Japanese one might only be like $300 to $500. I actually sold that Lugia already. I think it sold on eBay for $1,400 or something. That's pretty good. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the, and when like populations are so low, because there's like a lot of people that actually collect this stuff, it's not always about buying and selling. There's only 40 of the English PSA 10. You said there's only 40, but maybe 20 of those are locked up in collections. That's a big difference. Like there's only, then there's only 20 that could be available for sale. There's probably even less. There's probably only like five, 10 available for sale. Maybe if you ask them, not even listed on eBay, but the Japanese one, because they're so much easier to grade. I mean, I graded one. I'm sure someone else has graded one since I graded one, maybe like five other people. And they're probably trying to sell them. And then cause of you, cause there's so many 500, 600, thousand, whatever the pop is, they're going to be for sale more often, which would probably either keep the price the same or maybe drive it down a little bit. So uh, I hope that helps with the value versus pop. Sometimes low pop doesn't really mean that much. High pop doesn't really mean that much. It's all really, be, really, it's all like the main driving factor of the price of a graded card is how easy it is to replace. So for example, like this, oh, my knees, I'm getting old. This bad boy right here. Can we show that on the camera? Can you guys see that? This is the 001 SVP Pikachu incredibly easy to grade incredibly easy to get the price of the psa 10 is not very high i can sell that i could 99 percent chance i could get a psa 10 of that in another two months i could buy a raw one and grade another one and replace that really easy like the neo lugia it's worth a lot more even if a played raw one is like a hundred dollars or eighty dollars or whatever it's a lot harder for me to go and be like oh i'll just go get another gem mint lugia or just grade another 10 it's way harder so the price of it is a lot higher so usually the price of a PSA card is based on how hard it is to get that same card in that same grade. 
I uh, hope that helps you out. If you need more exp explanation, ask some more questions, let me know. Your average player zero. How do you gain confidence in your own ability to make decisions and spend money in the hobby without needed confirmation or approval from others in the hobby? I am young and have little confidence in general, but I know I have the ability and knowledge because I do really well. Sadly, I always feel the need to ask people about the things I do. I mean, look. Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. Hmm. So, you're young, and that's completely fine. And it's great that you're tackling this, and you're buying and selling, and you're trying to gain value, you're trying to get more cards, because you don't have the money to buy the cards, so you have to sell some, to buy some, to sell some, to buy some. It's very respect respectful, and I'm sure in five years' time, you'll look back, and you'll be like, this is the best thing I've ever done. Now I have all these cards, and I'm happy. Now, the first thing, asking people questions. If you're around people where you ask them questions and they answer them and they help you out. That's amazing. Thank those people whenever you have the time. Offer them a service if you can, if there are people that are helping you out regularly. You know, a lot of a lot of the things you can, the, the best way to get advice from people that are in positions that you want to be is to ask them questions, but also offer them help, offer them services, offer to do something for them or anything like that. I had people help me since day one I start. I have people helping me right now. I offer them the best things I can. I have friends that have helped me so many times in the past. I go, hey, if you need help selling some stuff, send it to me. I'll sell it to you, no fee. Whatever the fees are, I'll take them out and I'll give you your actual money. I'll sell some stuff for you, no fees included. It's not a big deal because I've had so many people help me out over time. If people want to get some cards that I have, a little bit more of a discount. And then in the future, maybe they'll give me some cards, a little bit of a discount. That's no big deal. We're friends. We help each other out. That's what it's about. There is no problem with actually asking people if you're around people where you feel bad for asking them that can either be two things but those people probably don't answer the questions very well or you were just you know you said you lack confidence and maybe you just feel bad for kind of asking and that's just like anxiety and growing up and everything like that that's perfectly fine i have that sometimes too if i'm trying to ask questions about things that aren't pokemon you know when it comes to like setting up my channel and doing a few other things and just getting it like even when i'm asking for like help on the videos and when i'm like hey what do you guys think about this video did you like this i don't really necessarily enjoy asking that question because it puts me in like a vulnerable state but if i don't ask i'm never going to know you have to understand that you not asking is a much worse timeline than you asking so you might feel bad if you ask but it's going to feel a whole lot worse if you don't ask and you never get the you know clarification but eventually you will get better at this and what you can do is offer advice and offer help to newer people that were in your position. Because, you know, for me, I don't really need that much help, to be honest, these days of like buying and selling. I don't need that much. I have heaps of friends that I bounce ideas off and I ask and we talk about stuff all the time. It's it's not a big deal. It's, a, you know, we just talk about it. But <laughs> I'm trying my best to answer this question without like waffling all that crazy. But uh, yeah, like I can make pretty confident decisions with 10, 20,000, 50,000 hundred thousand dollar purchases because i've just been doing it for so long and you just know in your head you just be like it's gonna work out it's gonna work out it's gonna work out i mean everyone who does trading cards they all have in the back of their head where this is just pieces of cardboard everything could go to crap right now like i mean i got booster boxes on the shelf here i don't know how much this cost me probably no 20 grand or something i don't know but i know i'll be able to sell these at least at the price i paid for them because I was smart about when I purchased them. And then I've like priced them at a certain amount where I can make some money and hopefully go buy some more stuff. And you just get more confidence when you do more stuff. That's why like with that question earlier, where it's like, would you sell lower dollar stuff or would you sell higher dollar stuff as a new seller? I would usually recommend people to sell lots of lower dollar stuff because it builds your confidence. It gets you an idea, hey, this stuff actually does work. Like if you've been to these stores and these collector cons and these like collectible places where you see like millions of dollars of transactions for cards every single day all around the world in physical stores not even on not even online ebay is nuts i mean ebay sells trillions bro it's actually just crazy not trillions but billions of dollars of everything there is just so much money moving through everything and that's what builds confidence when you make more sales and you get some more feedback when you're actually selling stuff but yeah i, re I really want to help you with this question your average player because you know you always comment a lot of things and you know, you are young and I'm, I'm doing my best to help you. So it's, um, 
you say you have little confidence and you sadly feel like you always need to ask people about the things I do. What you can do is I need you to do this for me. I, need, I mean, you don't have to show me, you don't have to show me you did it. But if you did listen to this video, what you should do is write down everything you've done on an Excel sheet, on a word pad, write it down on a piece of paper. People used to write with pens back in the day, pencils really, and then pens. <laughs> Write everything down about what you've done or what you think you've done. Items you've bought. If you've bought one of these PS, oh, P a Pikachu SVP promos and you graded it and you sold it, write it down. If you bought one and you have graded it and you haven't sold it, write it down. And then write the full thing. Whatever you've bought for your collection, see what price you bought it at. And maybe if you care about the value and you're trying to want things to go up or go down, or if you've got a good deal, you've got a good bad deal. Just write the current price of it. Everything you've bought and sold with the intention to like sell for a little bit more so you can buy some more stuff. Write it down. Write down everything and then just go and see how many wins you get. I mean, 99% of people who buy trading cards, who buy, I wouldn't say 90%, 99%, but like probably like 70% of people who buy like booster boxes, plushies, single cards, graded cards, raw cards, anything. They mostly always lose because this isn't like supposed to be some crazy investment where you just build value. It's not supposed to be, but like most people just lose because they're having fun with it. But if you can have fun with it and build value at the same time, it's incredible. So I want you to write down everything you've done. You said you're young, so maybe it hasn't been much so far. Write everything down and just see on paper. See how many wins you've got. And you will see over time, if you get more and more wins and then less losses, you might be in the right track. You know, if you do notice that you have a hundred losses in a row, Maybe you got to step back up for a bit, adjust, and maybe always feel free to reach out, ask some things. If run some things by me. I mean, I have probably 10 to 20 messages per day on Instagram. I don't care. If that was 100 to 200, I could probably still manage it. 1,000 to 2,000, probably not. But I don't care if it's 11 to 21 messages. Just always feel free to run something by me. If you send me a listing, hey, Steve, do you think you should buy this? Do you think what about the condition? You know, I can't really say whether a car can get a 10 or a 9 or a PSA 20 or a black label. But I can tell you what I think maybe it might be a good deal. And maybe I can give some advice like, oh, did you double check the solds or did you do this? Or more feedback is always good. And if you're asking people that aren't giving you, they're giving you feedback and making you feel bad for it, but maybe find some new people to ask. So that was a really long way to answer that question. But um, yeah, I do want to help you really badly. So I try my best with that question. Remember, I'm also not very good at answering questions, especially on camera. I've only been doing it for like six months now. So it's uh, something that's new to me as well. So I'm still learning for this. So just like I'm saying, maybe I won. Maybe I, I have little confidence in answering, answering questions, but maybe over time I'm getting better at answering them. And I don't know. We're about to wrap this video up. We've got two questions left. We have Pablo says, I would like us to show you, I would like you to show us where you buy modern Japanese cards to sell. Um, honestly, man, I probably would never, wouldn't even touch modern Japanese cards. There is like a million people doing it and 10,000 people buying on, you know, secondary markets. Uh, most Japanese, like these cards here, I buy these, I sell them graded PSA 10, I think. I make maybe $4 and they cost like 65 after shipping, grading fees, taxes, everything. So I wouldn't even touch Japanese cards. I would see what you like, try and build a position, follow all the advice. Don't look for these get rich quick Japanese modern things because more than likely everything will go down in price and the stuff you're buying, it'll, you'll come out with way less because you get caught up in hype and it'll be bad. I mean, it's, I wouldn't even touch it. I'm not even going to try and show you where you should buy it because I know you're probably going to do it even if I tell you not to. And you're going to end up with bad cards and you're going to end up losing money. So just focus on what you like, take it slow, and then build it slowly over time. Trust me, it's way better. Diamond Hands Pokemon. You mentioned regularly that you resubmit cards for grading. I think by now many people have their method of cracking slabs. Can you show the way you have found the safest to do that? Perhaps a separate video or have you already shared that info? I don't think I have a video on cracking graded cards. I might actually. But there's so many videos online. Just use one of those, honestly. It's really easy. You just... You know, get some pliers, crack one corner off, crack the other corner off, get like a knife or something strong, like a screwdriver, put it through the side, raise it up, case comes out, card comes out. It's super easy. I don't know, know how regularly I uh, mention cracking cards. I hope I don't, I don't make it that regularly because, you know, out of like, you know, the 12, 13,000 cards I've 
rated this year, I think I probably only cracked like like two submissions of like a hundred cards. So that's like not even that's like two percent. And that most of those just come back in the same grade. So I've probably regraded maybe 50 cards into more tens out of like the 12,000 cards I've regraded. 12,000 cards I've graded in total. And I do have a small pile of cards like over there somewhere where I think I'm going to double check them later on. They're PSA 9s. Maybe they can be PSA 10s. But I will say that like it is not something that anyone should really be focused on doing too much. Usually the PSA 9 is accurate. I'd probably say around 99% of the time. But just same thing with PSA 10. Sometimes PSA 10 is wrong, but no one really cracks those out. So yeah, I'm, uh, there's heaps of videos on cracking cards. And I don't really regularly resubmit that many cards for grading. I've done it twice this year with two submissions and I've graded 12,000 cards. So I hope that helps. And Transparent Pokemon finishes up with How Is It Down Under? How is it? How long is this video? That's That's what I'm asking. How is it? How long is this video? You know, I did record this video. Oh my God, this is an hour and 10 minutes. I did actually record this video, the first three questions, and I forgot to press play. That's how it is. Other than that, it's uh, getting hot. It's really bad. Mm. I hate the summers. It's uh, some of the worst. I'm lucky that I just get to sit inside most days with the air con on. It's uh, really hot right now. My back's probably covered in sweat. You know, I'm a pretty hairy guy with my my beard and my chest hair and stuff. And it just is really uncomfortable in Australia and the city I live in, in Brisbane. So other than that, I don't mind it. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, my sweaty in my armpits, probably. I don't even, can't even see that far. But yeah, it's not too bad. How are you going? You tell me on the next video how you go on Transparent Pokemon. Other than, yeah, it's not too bad other than the, in the hot weather, it gets kind of rough. But I'm lucky that I can stay inside, stay away from it. And uh, that's why I like doing this so much. I kind of be in my own space. But other than that, I hope you guys like this video. I know I went off on some tangents on some of those questions, but I do want to answer them to the best of my ability. I don't want to just, oh yeah, this is that, this is that. I don't, I don't care how long these videos take because I only get to do them once. You know what I mean? Like I get to answer the question once and then on to the next video. So I'm trying and yeah, it's not that easy for me. For some people, it is to sit there and give the advice and read the question. I don't read the questions before the video because I like to like give my first take on them. But yeah, it's not that easy for me. I'm getting better. <laughs> and I appreciate all the support, guys. You know, like I said earlier, like if I hope the channel just stays like it is, I'll be so happy because, you know, 30 questions, that's super easy for me to manage in one video. If we ever get to like 60, 70, 100, I mean, there's going to be some four hour videos. <laughs> I'll do it, but I don't know if I'll like it. And my throat's like, oh. But we're getting better. Um, my name's Steve. I hope you're having a great day. And oh, check this out. If you guys don't have these in your country, Nutella biscuits. This is like an ad for Nutella biscuits. You guys got to buy these. These are like, these are fucking delicious. Delicious. That's a biscuit with Nutella inside. Let me show you. You see here. This is like a biscuit. So I like sausage. I like pastry. I don't know if you realize. I like pastries. I like cookies. I'm a bit of a, I'm a, bit of a fat bastard. A bit of a fat bastard. So check this out. Ready? Oh. Nutella inside the cookie. That is. Mm. It's like shortbread too. That's some good shit. All right, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Have a great day. <laughs>